See How They Run by Susan E. Goodman, illustrated by Elwood H. Smith. A Short History of Democracy, The Beginnings. When was the first election? It's impossible to tell. For all we know, people voted in prehistoric times. Flint, Flint, he's our man. If he can't cave paint, no one can. Elect Grog, keeper of the flame. A vote for Homo sapiens is a vote for progress. Early people may have had elections. We just can't be sure. They didn't have a written language, so they couldn't leave us records, let alone campaign posters or bumper stickers. Beware of Greeks bearing gifts. The ancient Greeks get credit for inventing democracy, probably because they had the best word for it. The demo part comes from demos, which means the people. Chrissy comes from creatine, meaning to rule, rule by the people. Starting in 510 BC, the citizens of Athens, Greece, gathered in the assembly and voted on important community issues. Each one had an equal voice in deciding what would happen. This was the purest democracy of all time, sort of. Only adult males, born in Athens, with Athenian parents, could be citizens with full legal rights. That meant only one out of eight Athenians could vote on decisions that affected all of their lives. There's no place like Rome. Around the same time and a little to the west, the city of Rome began working on its version of democracy, that is, when its citizens or armies weren't too busy conquering everyone else around them. Roman democracy was different from the Greek version, in which ordinary citizens voted on major issues. Instead, Romans voted to pick the people who would make decisions for them. They elected senators who held their jobs for life. They also elected leaders called consuls who controlled the army and created laws. But a Roman citizen's best privilege was being the only one in the empire who could wear a toga. Eventually, Roman leaders became a little too power hungry. Julius Caesar got himself declared dictator for life. Augustus took the title of emperor. Then he went all out and declared himself a god. So far, our presidents have shown more self-control. A place in history talk about power, both Julius Caesar and Augustus named months after themselves, July and August. 1800 years later, here comes American democracy. George Washington and the rest of our founding fathers borrowed bits and pieces from past democracies to create our own. They named our Senate after the Roman Senate. They adopted a British idea from the 13th century saying that the government must respect a citizen's legal rights. George and his crew wanted a government where people had some say in how to rule the country, but not too much. They didn't trust all their fellow Americans, especially those without much education. So they rejected the Greek method of having citizens vote directly on laws. Decisions would be made by people who represented the citizens instead, just like in the Roman Republic. Stop and check. Ask and answer questions. Why did the Founding Fathers reject the Greek method of voting? Go back to the text to find the answer. In 1787, the Founding Fathers locked themselves up for four months to write our Constitution. Coming up with this description of our new government wasn't easy. They all had different ideas and had to compromise. George Washington's face often wore its Valley Forge look. Here's what they came up with. A national government with three branches. Our Congress, the legislative branch, has two parts or houses, the Senate and the House of Representatives. Congress can make laws to raise taxes, improve citizens' lives, and defend the country. The president heads the executive branch. He and someday soon maybe she, carries out laws and is head of the military. 
He also appoints judges to the Supreme Court, part of our judicial branch. The court's job is to enforce existing laws and decide if the other two branches are obeying the Constitution. What did Ben say? Shortly after the Constitutional Convention ended, a woman asked Benjamin Franklin what kind of government the Founding Fathers created. Franklin's answer? A republic, madam, if you can keep it. In other words, our kind of government needs citizens who care enough to stay informed and take part. In other, other words, vote! Getting better all the time. Is the Constitution a perfect plan? Nope, but the people who wrote it were smart enough to know that. They improved it right away by writing the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments or additions to the Constitution. We've been making it better ever since. The good news, the United States was the first modern democracy with an elected government protecting the freedom and rights of its citizens. The bad news, in the beginning, only white men who owned land could vote. The good news, in 1856, white men who didn't own land got that right. The bad news, everyone else was still left out in the cold. Changing beliefs and values isn't easy. It takes a lot of thought and struggle. The good news, African American and other non-white men began voting in 1870. The bad news, people's beliefs and values change too slowly. An African American's right to vote was often denied in the South and parts of the North until the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s. The good news, American women of all races got the vote in 1920. The bad news, women in New Zealand, Australia, Finland, Norway, Canada, Estonia, England, Ireland, the Soviet Union, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Germany, Hungary, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Poland, Luxembourg, and Holland were able to vote before them. At least the United States beat Switzerland, where women couldn't vote until 1971. The good news, Native Americans began voting in 1924. The bad news, seems like a long wait given that they were here first. What's more, some states banned them from voting until the 1940s. The good news, in 1971, the voting age was reduced to 18 years old. The bad news, you've still got a while before you can vote. The good news, you have other ways to make your opinion heard. Keep reading to find out what they are. Uncle Sam wants you. Prescription for voting. When people are involved with their communities, their knowledge of politics grows. Their interest and commitment does too. That's true for kids as well as grown-ups. Okay, you aren't old enough to vote, not even close, but you can still have a voice in our democracy. Four million kids already cast ballots on election day. They're part of a program called Kids Voting USA in schools in 28 states and Washington, D.C. True, their votes aren't counted in official tallies, but they're announced in schools and on local TV stations. This program has another advantage. Kids get so excited that three to five percent more of their parents end up voting too. That's where you come in. Even if Kids Voting USA isn't in your school, you can make sure your parents are registered to vote, and you can make sure they actually do it. How? Oh, come on, how do you get your parents to do anything? Drive you somewhere, buy a new game, let you stay up late? You bug them. So bug them about voting. Plaster a countdown calendar on the front door. Put reminders on their voicemail. Email too. If they say they're too tired on the big day, try a bribe. It works when they want something from you. Offer to do the dishes if they go, but only if you're desperate. Stop and check. Ask and answer questions. How does the Kids Voting USA program encourage people to vote? Go back to the text to find the answer. Kids to the rescue. Bugging your parents is a good first step. 
Some kids are going even further. They are identifying issues and working on them. A recent report found that 55% of American kids volunteer. That's almost twice as many as adults. Kids are becoming leaders. Talk about bugging. A group of second graders decided that Massachusetts needed an official state insect. When they learned that any state resident could give legislators ideas for new laws, they got busy. Maybe it was the ladybug costumes they wore while visiting the state capitol. Maybe it was their speech saying ladybugs could be found all over the state. Whatever the reason, the legislature approved their bill and the govern governor signed a law proclaiming the ladybug as Massachusetts' state insect. Third and fourth graders did something similar for New Hampshire, which didn't have a state fruit. The hardest thing about that process was convincing legislators that the pumpkin is a fruit. At age seven, Shadia Wood learned that the Superfund bill would clean up New York's worst toxic waste sites. For seven years, Shadia and a group called Kids Against Pollution tried to convince lawmakers to pass this bill. She had a lemonade stand on the steps of the state capitol selling drinks and toxic dump cake. Then she'd send the profits to the governor to help pay for the Superfund. Eventually, TV and newspaper reporters noticed what she was doing. The Superfund bill became law in 2003. There's nothing wrong with shaming grown-ups into good behavior. Imagine getting $135 to skip school and do good work. When Massachusetts's governor signed a bill to let 16 and 17 year olds work at the polls, Boston-based students began helping voters with computerized equipment on election day. It's a win, win, win situation. Kids know computers better than many adult voters. They get involved with voting, they get money. They are also being trained for the job. Our country will need them soon. The average poll worker is currently 72 years old. In Boise, Idaho, kids ages 15 and up are on committees governing the city. Some towns, like Linesville, Pennsylvania, have had 18-year-old mayors. Mayor at 18 seems pretty great. But in California, Ohio, Rhode Island, Vermont, Washington, and Wisconsin, an 18-year-old can be governor. Sending a message. If you see a problem in your community or have an idea of how to make things better, get active. Give a government leader a piece of your mind. The best part, please. Speak up at a town meeting. Invite your mayor or another official to speak to your class about an important issue. Be ready to ask good questions and give your opinions. Set up a class trip to visit him or her. Write a letter or email that identifies a problem. Tell how the problem affects you and your community. Write about the changes you'd like to see. Send your letters to the appropriate official in your town or to your state representative and senator or to your representative and senator in Congress or even to the governor or president. Write a letter and get people who agree with you to sign it too. Make sure you write your names and addresses clearly. Make a survey about the problem, write it up, and send it to the right official. Stop and check. Summarize. How can kids make their voices heard about community issues?